and I have a co-pilot with me. His name is Ted Sturm. He will be the person that will uh, be asking the questions. Uh, because of uh, talk over traffic and so forth, uh, we ask that you send in questions uh, via the type in uh, questions bar. Uh, Ted will see those and um, ask the questions, uh, interrupt me during the presentation and ask the uh, uh, questions if appropriate uh, to the slide or he might delay them to a, a different point within the presentation. Uh, also a part of a little bit of housekeeping. At the very end, there is a short survey. If you could please fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. It helps us uh, um, improve our presentations. And there's also an opportunity for you to uh, uh, make note on something you'd like to see us uh, talk about, kind of like the TV show Dirty Jobs with all their ads. Uh, we might have some good ideas, but they might not be what you, uh, you want to hear and learn about. So please. Just a minute afterwards, fill it out, and then we'll, we really appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, uh, today's uh, webinar is uh, Learning to Build a Resilient Video Surveillance and Storage Solution, or How to Meet the Increasing Demand for No Single Point of Failure Surveillance. We're starting to, uh, uh, today, see more and more specifications that require uh, no single point of failure within the entire subsystem. Uh, sometimes it's relegated to just no single point of failure or high availability within the storage subsystem. We're going to cover soup to nuts and uh, um, show you how it lays out, things that you have to consider uh, along the way. Uh, additionally, uh, for the end users, think about this. For the resellers that are attending, if things aren't mentioned as part of the specification, uh, please use some of this information to, uh, to question um, the specification. Uh, there's a lot of times there's ambiguity in what the spec says versus what they really want to accomplish. Okay, before we get into servers and storage, right, uh, uninterruptible power, get it. It should always be planned for. Uh, the reality is the majority of system failures or downtime throughout the United States or for that matter the world is due to loss of power. In the United States, the average business loses power eight times a year uh, with an average outage of 27 minutes. Right? The other thing that uh, uninterruptible power supplies uh, protect you from our brownouts low power, not power being gone, and power spikes. Both of these cause damage uh, to the systems. Uh, particularly power spikes uh, tend to put a little bit of wear on the power supplies uh, and shortens their overall life. If you have questions about uh, what, what your power history is like, uh, your local power companies are required by law to keep track of and have reports available. Uh, for their outages and their durations and so forth. They can even, uh, if you really wanted to drill down, give you specifics uh, within uh, towns, uh, for instance, or cities, and segments or areas within the city. Uh, when you're sizing your uninterruptible power supplies, uh, determine what is the maximum downtime uh, that they can uh, incur. A lot of sites on the, the larger sites have a contingency plan where if they're going to lose power for longer than X, then they'll actually bring in physical guards uh, or people to man certain stations or uh, perimeter stations, key locations within buildings and so forth uh, to maintain some kind of surveillance and security. Um, and the other thing is list the most critical areas of surveillance. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a site might have 45 cameras, and the reality is they need to uh, maintain surveillance in, a, in the most critical areas would only be eight cameras. Um, so you can, you can disperse UPSs uh, uh, as, as required to make the critical application uh, rather than normal operations. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other thing is all UPSs are not created equal. 
Uh, so when you're selecting your UPS system, make sure that it's got software that runs within the NVR. And the other thing that's critical is the connection. A lot of the new systems have USB connections only. Your system might, uh, or your storage array, or your server might only uh, be able to accept network notification or um, serial port notification. So double check uh, one that the software is compatible, or there's an alternate software package that the vendor can supply that will run across storage and servers, and that you have the right connection types in order for it to all fit into a heterogeneous uh, uh, environment. Um, next, always plan a, a little bit ahead uh, for battery life. Uh, a new battery is what the specification is written for, and that would reflect your uptime based on how much power you draw. Uh, batteries aren't quite as efficient and don't have the same um, poop, I guess is the way I put it, after they've been sitting there for a year or two. So um, fudge in a factor for uh, decreased uh, battery efficiencies. And uh, use multiple units and sizes uh, as, as you deem appropriate uh, within the, the confines of your surveillance solution. And any time that you get beyond these 30-minute uh, to two-hour, three-hour hold-up times, uh, which is a typical sizing for UPS, motor generators uh, become uh, uh, more of a requirement than a, than a simple UPS uh, uh, would be. So uh, within a lot of facilities, uh, you'll find that they do already have motor generators. The question is, how fast do they kick in? Uh, will that kick in time and that delay cause problems uh, with your servers rebooting, your storage rebooting? Uh, so if you're, if you're questioning and you're working with a uh, prospect in a situation or you're designing uh, a specification, do examine how the motor generators will take over and what the switch over time is and so forth. Dick, I have a question for you. Yeah. How long should battery backups last? You know, it depends on, it, it, there isn't a set answer for that. Um, it, it, the, the, if you were in an IT environment, the answer is, is fairly simple. Uh, you would determine what is the typical average power outage that you have, and uh, you would balance that against how long does it take to shut down your system. So in an IT environment, you, the questions would be, uh, do I want a size to uh, hopefully ride out the normal outage period or time length? Or do I just want to size it so that I can bring the system down in an orderly fashion? Uh, I would apply those same metrics to uh, UPS uptime. Uh, how long does it take for you to uh, deploy a secondary uh, contingency plan? Uh, that would be one of your first questions. The second question is, do you want to try to outride the normal power failure uh, times that you've been quoted from your power company, or do you want to just shut the system down? Now, shutting the system down is very important, uh, and here's why. You've, been, you've all been in thunderstorms, and that's the best way to, to look at this. It's not that your power went off. It's that your power kept coming back and back on and off, on and off, on and off. And if you will, at a power supply level for storage or cameras or switches, whatever the components are, that's like hitting the power supply with an electrical hammer, right? So uh, you want to avoid that. Your UPS is going to take care of that problem for you, and you want to bring the system down in an orderly fashion, particularly with today's surveillance applications. A lot of them are very sophisticated. Uh, database applications, they have numerous pointers open, they have open files. And if you just shut that system down, uh, as in pulling the plug, if you will, uh, you run a very high risk of corrupting your data. So uh, number one, do you want to give yourself enough time for a secondary contingency plan? Do you want to try to outrun or outlast a normal power outage? And on top of that, or in conjunction or before, do you just want to shut the system down and wait for 
whatever seems to be happening to go away and then bring everything back up. Great, thank you. All righty. Okay, again, in the before the servers and storage, keep it cool. Uh, remember, uh, cooling requirements aren't just for the management center uh, where you have your centralized storage and the bulk of your equipment and monitoring going in. Fringe areas typically get stuck up in the ceiling. They get stuck in a uh, equipment closet uh, somewhere in the facility. And in almost all cases, uh, there isn't any cooling there. Uh, these machines do throw out an appreciable amount of heat. If you combine that with in a very small environment, along with the fact that there's transformers and other electronic equipment in those closets, uh, you're going to run the temperature up and you're basically going to burn the product up. Um, the other one is switches. Uh, switches for camera POE uh, switches many times are not sitting in a nice rack with long cable runs. Rather, they're stuck up with an auxiliary power plug in the ceiling. Those areas between the suspended ceilings and the actual physical ceiling are very warm. Uh, so that's another thing to consider uh, when you're, you're deciding where you're going to place equipment. Uh, and the other one is cameras. A lot of people forget this. These are all things that just get overlooked along the way. If you're sitting in a facility and it's got nice 30-foot ceilings and a glass atrium and you've got that uh, camera that's sitting up uh, you know, 30 feet off the ground, what's 70 degrees and very comfortable for you on a hot sunny day for that camera could be 120 degrees, 130 degrees. The sun could be shining right through the nice glass atrium right on the camera uh, and adding to uh, a thermal problem that's there. So uh, when you're looking at temperatures and cooling. Don't forget the fringe areas. Don't forget uh, unusual locations for cameras or switches and power supplies. Uh, next one is noise is not just sound. There is EMI. Remember, the intent here is we're trying to go holistically, uh, giving you a, a system that works from uh, top to bottom. Um, Surveillance hardware in fringe areas uh, is usually, as I mentioned before, shares space. Uh, in my experience, it's been you open up these closets and there's a giant box with a power step down power transceiver that's humming. Uh, those types of things, do, they emit a lot of EMI. So whenever you can, keep the equipment as far away from these types of items that generate uh, um, electromagnetic uh, uh, interference. Uh, even the routing of the cables, yeah, they're shielded, uh, but again, keep them away from noise surfaces. All of these things feed back. It's either going to affect camera quality, it's going to induce noise into the switch, which creates transport problems back to the NVRs. Just route them away from things that uh, uh, you think would uh, emit uh, excess of uh, uh, EMI. Make sure your cables are always uh, grounded and connected correctly on both sides. Uh, and also double check that all of your cameras, switches, servers, any components that are properly grounded, uh, preferably with isolated grounds uh, as opposed to a regular switch box that you'd see. Dick, I have a question for you. Yeah. What if there's no cooling that fringe areas are in some of the closets? You know, there are a lot of, uh, the first thing, that if there aren't any, the first thing that uh, you would want to do is uh, talk with the, uh, the facilities manager. Uh, he's going to have contacts uh, uh, with their HVAC people, their heating and cooling people. Uh, he, he, he probably, typically, uh, those types of people are close enough that they can affect change. The first thing that normally happens is, uh, there's a duct that's nearby that they can force cold air into it, uh, and they can vent the door so that it, you know, you can't blow cold air into a sealed room. It doesn't have anywhere to go. So they'd have to effect a way to force cold air into it, tapping off of a, a closed duct, and also make a provision for the air to come out uh, in some fashion, uh, normally just with a simple vent. If if that's not that's not available or that can't be done, 
there are an awful lot of small, uh, they, they typically don't call them air conditioners, they call them heat carriers, but there are a lot of small, very small units uh, that can carry the heat from the closet up into ceiling space and those types of things. Uh, so you can uh, very inexpensively, and in a lot of cases very inexpensively, if you can tap off existing ductwork, you can cool those closets. Now if you just stick something up in the ceiling, um, Try to put it by a return. Remember, your forest air is going to run through its own ductwork. The returns typically run just through the ceiling. So if you can put it by a, those plastic grates that you see where you're going to get some cooling return uh, coming back, that will also help the situation. Thank you. All righty. Okay. Uh, we're still pre-server and storage here. Shore up those network connections. Uh, anytime you have a single box anywhere along the line, if it's a single camera, a single switch, a single server, that's a point of failure. Right? And even within those uh, single points of failure, you can do things to help uh, relieve them or uh, present them as a, a longer lived or lived, excuse me, product. Uh, many of the switches that are available today have an option for a second or a hot swap power supply within it. The, the two things that fail the most in any piece of electronic equipment in the commercial world today, power supplies and fans. Typically the cooling is handled with the fans and a switch level with the power supplies. Uh, so anytime that you have an option uh, to put in redundant power or redundant cooling option, sometimes they're separate, please take advantage of that. Even if you're going to put in a secondary switch, uh, the redundancy features within the switch are going to enhance the total system's ability to stay up for longer periods of time. And it also gives you a longer period of time to react. So if you lost a power supply and you still had a redundant switch, you might not put the same priority on getting that replacement uh, fan in because you still know you have an extra level to go. You'll you'll save a dollar or two in not bringing it in FedEx overnight, for instance. You could bring it in three day and know that you're still being proactive and taking care of the situation. Um, the other thing beyond power supplies and fans, use multiple ports. Switches have the ability to trunk uh, individual ports together, not just to give you more bandwidth, but also to to define a failover path. If one of the two connections fails, the other one is you're going to lose bandwidth, but you're still going to have the ability to transport video data or storage data over the second pair or quad pair, uh, however many units you're using the trunking um, uh, setup. So you're giving yourself multiple paths again within the switch. Again, if you have a redundant switch, uh, you're providing those extra levels of performance as well as uh, redundancy uh, within the subsystem. And there's a feature uh, that goes along with switches and uh, servers and storage. It's called MPIO. It's multi-path IO. Within your servers and your storage, whether you're using, you have to always have more than one port, two, four, eight ports, uh, turn on MPIO so that the server is cognizant that if it loses a route to its storage, it will take an alternate route automatically. Uh, totally uh, transparent to you and again uh, sustains uh, the ability to uh, write and uh, read or view video. Uh, very quickly, uh, extra network pass adds storage resiliency. It's not just for performance. In a typical situation, if you had redundant uh, switches, you can see I've got two different paths. I'm using um, multi-path cameras, and I'm writing my data using a single NVR to my, my centralized storage using two different paths. If I lose a path, I lost uh, two switches, and I cut the cables between all of them. Uh, the switches will take over and route the data and take it holistically and route it to through the NBR and back down to the centralized storage. So again, you're adding to the resiliency uh, of your total solution. Okay, before we get into a little more nuts and bolts, 
all storage musts. And can, can this, we back up for just a moment? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, sure. The partial question was, what do you mean cable shielding is correctly attached on both ends? Okay. Uh, when you buy a shielded cable, uh, and unfortunately, I'll say this first, I see a lot of people running a Cat5 cable, and it's not shielded. A correctly uh, shielded uh, Category 5 cable, which is what most of us are using uh, to connect our, our cameras to our switches, you'll notice that there's a metal housing on the uh, back side of each of the connectors. And if you were to peel back a little bit of the heat shrink, you would find there's a braid and foil shield that goes over around all of the wires. That has to be attached to those metal connectors on both sides. And if it isn't attached to both sides, rather than do, you, you would rather use a non-shielded cable at that point because now you've created a 150-foot metal antenna that's going to take any RF, any kind of uh, magnetic noise, anything, and it's actually going to receive it and it's going to bring it back. And it, since it doesn't have any place to go, to ground on both sides, it's going to radiate through the actual signal cables, and uh, it can cause a lot of problems. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, back to all storage must. Okay, uh, and this goes for if you have a single NVR with its RAID storage built inside it, or if it's a single centralized units, right? Redundant hot swap power to the disks. Those power supplies are typically in the back. Redundant cooling, uh, as I mentioned before, power supplies and fans, that's what's going to go. Uh, take it to the bank, all right? Uh, so you need a quick, easy way. You don't want to shut down the system or the storage, unscrew the cover, unscrew the fans. Uh, you know, you, you want to have a system where you can get yourself back up and running without interrupting service. So if you have a redundant hot swap power and cooling disk, you're going to be uh, notified. You're going to identify where the product uh, failed visually within the uh, subsystem or box, and uh, just pull out a box, slide it in the power supply. Bam, you're back up. You didn't interrupt anything. Everything continued to work. Oh, you didn't lose any video. There was no uh, service interruption at all. Um, RAID protection. RAID 5 provides one drive failure per array. RAID 6 means that you can have two drives fail before your storage array that holds your video goes down. There is a small penalty of, in write performance for RAID 6, but you can design that into the overall bandwidth requirements and storage subsystem uh, performance requirements to give you that extra protection uh, that RAID 6 uh, will afford you. Now, uh, you know, it's easy for me to spend your money, uh, but whenever you can, uh, look at RAID 6 for that extra nudge and protection. Uh, the other thing is a storage must. If things fail and you don't know, it really doesn't do you any good. Uh, there are a few subsystems that don't do this, but consider uh, at a minimal, you need an audible and a visual, blinking red LEDs and a loud, obnoxious horn buzzing from the system if one of the power supplies goes bad or one of the fan cooling units goes bad. Uh, do shop for this feature, email notification. You can actually program into arrays, uh, storage arrays, as well as servers, uh, that they will send an email to one or two people notifying them that they lost a power supply or they lost a fan, they've gone into thermal um, um, overdrive, those types of things. So consider that uh, if it's not written into the spec for end users, write it into the spec. Uh, for resellers, if you don't see it, question it and, and see if you can't uh, make sure that it becomes part of the spec because it's very important. Uh, we had a site that uh, they decided not to configure the email notification. The air conditioning went down. Uh, our servers were perfectly capable of not notifying on thermal uh, uh, overdrive. 
and they didn't, and by the time they discovered it, the room was at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, needless to say, uh, there was a lot of damaged equipment. Interestingly enough, our servers and arrays continue to work fine. Uh, these are the facts. Poor cooling contributes to 90% of premature electronic and electromechanical failures. Right? Power supplies and fans have a 75% chance of failing within two years. That does not mean all power supplies are going to fail within two years and all fans. And there's always going to be that person that said, I had two fans fail the first year. And that I'm going to, I would be able to counter with the guy that never had a power supply failure or fan failure in five years. But on average, um, within a two-year period, you're going to have a failure within these types of solutions that you're building. Arrays with 16 drives on them have a 50% chance of at least one drive failing within two years. The more drives that you have, the higher percentage that you're going to have a drive failure or more drive failures. So it is critical uh, that you plan all of your uh, storage uh, with having at least RAID 5 protection, data protection. Okay, I have a question. Speaking of yes. RAID, when would RAID 6 be the appropriate choice over RAID 5? Um, I, I kind of have a break point. I'm, I'm still kind of a, personally, I'm a RAID 5 person with a hot spare or a global spare because uh, once the drive fails, it can automatically, if you had multiple RAID sets, it'll take that global spare and start to rebuild to it. And it gives you an opportunity, again, to come in and replace the bad drive at a, at a later point. Um, well, well, the guideline I use is typically I like to spec 16 drives in a RAID set. And if I have to go over 16 drives in a RAID set, uh, a lot of, we, for instance, we sell a 24 bay uh, product. It's a great product. But I would never recommend a RAID 5 set with 24 drives. There I'd say, you know what, break it up into two RAID sets, RAID 5, or go to RAID 6. Uh, there's also a lot of situations where practicality and expense come into play. Uh, an individual needs, it always seems to work out this way, Individual needs 15 terabytes of usable storage. Well, that would mean a single 3U box with 16 drives. And uh, that would provide you with RAID 5 protection. So at a, at a practical cost measure, you would say, I can get this RAID 5 box and 15 terabytes exactly what I need, and it's uh, just $15,000. But if I want RAID 6 perform, uh, protection, I've got to get another box or a bigger box. It's going to cost me another five to ten thousand dollars. You kind of look at it, you juggle, and you say, "I, you know, I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to go with RAID five protection." So sometimes budgets uh, or the physical uh, constraints of how the solution lays out uh, forces you to go RAID five, even though you really kind of wish you could go RAID six. Great, thank you. All right, uh, before we move into um, high availability storage in NVRs, um, all-in-one NVRs where you have the storage uh, all built in within the unit, or even single controller iSCSI storage solutions. Um, they, you know, they have redundant power cooling, RAID data uh, protection. These are all significant measures uh, to maintain uptime. Uh, but you have to realize, when you lose a motherboard, a RAID controller, the OS hangs, the application has a failure running within an NVR, you're down. You have one box and you have a single particular problem, you're down. Right? Uh, same thing with storage. Uh, if you have a single controller product, again, multiple layers of protection. But if that main board goes down inside that iSCSI storage, you do not have the ability to uh, read or write video anymore. It's that simple. Um, so anytime you have one, you have a single point of failure. OK. Uh, we're kind of moving from the environment uh, through the uh, network. And now we're finally coming to uh, uh, high availability storage. Now, a high availability storage 
uh, can be rated and it can be uh, called uh, high availability to different levels. Our definition of high availability storage means that there's multiple input path failover from the NVRs. There is multiple iSCSI protocol storage controller failover capability as well as RAID protection and multiple pathing to the hard storage arrays themselves. Uh, and we do this all within a single confine. Our controllers are active-active, meaning, again, part of our high availability definition is both controllers are running and giving you tremendous performance if one, and this mode is called active-active, if one of them fails, the secondary controller or the controller that didn't fail will take over the other iSCSI controller's responsibilities. One step farther in our definition is when the failure is taken care of, the FRU is replaced, the power supply, whatever it was uh, that caused the failure in the, the other unit, it will self-heal and go back into an active-active mode automatically. So the DNF security definition of high availability uh, is very high. It's, uh, some people say, well, I have one unit, and there's a mirror of the other unit, and if this one goes over, I can go and tell my server to uh, start to write data over to there. We have that with our single control products, uh, but that's not, that's not our definition. It's supposed to be seamless. It's supposed to be self-healing. And that's what uh, our, high, our Seahawk SX uh, brings to the table. Um, we can lose a uh, NVR NIC path. We can lose a whole switch. We can lose one of our array controllers. We can lose up to two disks with RAID 6 protection. And we can lose half of all of the redundant power supplies available. And uh, one step more, we can actually lose an entire iSCSI controller and continue to run. This is what you need if you're going to guarantee a high availability environment. Um, and the term used, it's five nines. Our, our storage subsystem uh, can provide up to 99.999% uptime uh, for your recording uh, requirements. Okay. The next tier up is a uh, high availability NVRs. <clears throat> now this can be. I just, a, I'm sorry. I, I just yeah. had a question come back through. Uh, yeah just now. How large can the Seahawk SX uh, grow? Ah, the Seahawk SX can expand to 256 drives or 512 terabytes of storage. Now, don't view that as a limitation. Well, suppose I need more. The, the thing that you have to understand with iSCSI storage, and one of my previous uh, webinars kind of shows uh, best practices in uh, in how to deploy. Uh, as you as you have a number of cameras, they're going to write to a physical drive, which is a virtual drive within our storage subsystem. Uh, so as you add cameras and you increase your storage requirements, you can expand the Seahawk SX up to 512 terabytes of uh, data, and so little less. I think it's 480 uh, with RAID 6 protection. Um, but you can expand that single unit, and as you're adding cameras and, and increasing your storage requirements beyond that, you, you're going to be tacking in additional NVRs. You're going to be tacking in additional Seahawks. So your cameras just will point to a different uh, route through a different NVR and to a different centralized uh, Seahawk SX. So don't view 512 terabytes as a limit view it as the beginning of being able to expand horizontally. Great, thank you. High availability NVRs. When I first uh, started helping out in this group, uh, I was always amazed. People wanted high availability storage. That was the new buzz. And I would look and I'd say, well, what about that fringe system server that you have out there that's handling 64 cameras down the road? you don't care about that one? <laughs> and they go, well, we don't have the technology to do that. And I viewed this 
high availability requirement is kind of funny. I got storage and it's going to run all day long, but if I lose any of my NVRs, who cares? It can't, it's not getting anything to write. Nobody can see anything. Well, in the last year, increasingly more and more and more of the RFQs that we see require high availability, not just in the storage, but from the NVRs themselves. And this can be achieved uh, three different ways. Uh, the, you can use third-party applications that layer on top of the OS in both of the NVRs. And essentially, they, one's a primary, one's a passive secondary. And this third-party application, I, there's a number, but I, I, I won't spill the beans, um, that says, are you available? Yeah, I'm available. Are you available? Yeah, I'm available. And the secondary at the same time is cognizant that the primary is talking to it. As soon as the secondary doesn't hear it anymore, he has the same data presented to him on the camera side. He has the same accessibility to the central storage. So what he does is he just takes over. He says, well, I can only assume that the primary is down, so I better take the camera data and start writing it myself. The other way that uh, you're going to get high availability across NVRs is the actual surveillance application itself. Uh, typically, uh, you'll see the enterprise or the, uh, the enterprise tag of whatever application you're buying will have the ability built in. So rather than using a third-party application, they've built in the ability to, again, talk between a primary and secondary unit, and when the secondary recognizes that the primaries might not be there anymore, uh, take over. So that would be an option or a level of attainment within uh, different uh, companies' surveillance uh, applications that you purchase. And the last way is, uh, and this is the increasingly popular way to do it, is a virtual OS. Uh, the big two, uh, VMware and Zen, both of them have a, a product called HA, so VMware HA, Zen HA, clever, uh, where they actually, they, they take control of everything. Well, let me, I'll flick screens here for you. Um, within, if you look on the left side, you'll see I have a box that's called a primary NVR. And at the base level is the actual operating system. So VMware, I use them, they're kings. Uh, or Zen is sitting there, and it's the real operating system. It controls the NICs, the I.O., it's, uh, it apportions CPU power, memory usage, and so forth. So it's the master. Then layered on top of that is what they call a guest OS. In our case, the most popular is Windows Server 2008. And within the server 2008 now, it thinks it's a real computer and it's running real applications. So it's going to run your surveillance application. All right. So what happens is VMware HA or Zen HA is, is cognizant of what guest operating systems it has, and it also knows what applications it has, and it knows what the application is doing. Not in the sense of I've got camera A, B, C, and D data coming in, and I'm writing it to this drive. It's cognizant at a Windows server level of what resources it's using. So if the primary NVR goes down, all of the shared information of what is the server doing, what is the application doing, where is the I.O. coming and going from, that's always being shared with the secondary NVR. So when the primary goes down, the secondary VMware HA operating system says, whoa, I've lost my primary. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my server 2008 up and all of its dependencies and users. Then I'm going to fire up the application. And I'm going to then start, after I get my application running, I'm going to start taking I.O. from the cameras and doing what the application and the guest OS tells me to do, which is write data to the centralized storage. All right. Now, what's nice about this is VMware and Zen create a guest OS that looks and feels like a server. So the multitude of people who do not and did not build into um, their, their application software the ability to fail over 
uh, they can use VMware and Zen uh, to, to to create this high availability market. Do check uh, with your surveillance software company to make sure that they're VMware or Zen uh, Citrix Zen HA compatible. And if they are, um, we're prepared. We configure systems uh, all the time with a baseline of VMware and uh, uh, server software and then application on top of it. I think I have a question for you. Yes. Is the switch over in, in the uh, event of failure instantaneous? I'd like to say yes, but it's not. Uh, there is a certain amount of time. Uh, the the actual server guest OS switchover is virtually instantaneous, and the application, uh, whatever amount of time it takes for your application to come up, if you were to boot today, if you're familiar with your a system that you have or, or a system that you sell, when you see that application start, the amount of time it takes before the cameras come online is going to be the same amount of time that it takes uh, to be fully failed over and migrated to the secondary system. This time can range from 15 seconds uh, to two minutes, but it is something that you have to plan for uh, if you're a reseller and, uh, and, and present that, because if you don't tell them it's not instantaneous, uh, there are certain requirements, or a lot of the uh, government requirements have a uh, no more than 30 second um, migration time period. They can't lose more than 30 seconds of data. Um, so in that case, you might have to create multiple uh, application instances and lower your camera startup times in order to meet those numbers. Thank you. All right. OK, the perfect no single point of failure surveillance solution. Uh, by spec or by definition, this should do it. I've got dual feed cameras running into redundant camera switches, PoE switches, with hot swap power supplies in them. Out, coming out of those, I've provided for multiple points uh, to come out. Now, if a switch fails, great. Uh, remember, we've talked about power supplies failing, fans failing, and on a switch, you're more likely to lose a port than the whole unit. This could be because of a electrostatic discharge, a thunderstorm, any number of reasons. So if you have trunk lines coming out of your switch, if you lose a port, you still have two, three, four, five, six, however many ports you put in the link uh, running into your NVRs. Again, uh, NVRs would be configured in your choice of high availability configuration. Uh, so they're available to fail over. Uh, all except for our entry level towers and our, I think, one model of our uh, rack mounts, they come with redundant power supplies. Uh, they come with multiple NIC ports and sometimes different NIC cards within the ports. Outbound again, not just to carry bandwidth to storage, but again for failure and as earlier discussed, multi point IO or multi path IO, the ability to fail over uh, your pathing uh, to your storage. Same uh, as above, we use the same uh, concepts for our SAN switches as we did with our camera LAN. Uh, redundant switching, redundant power, redundant cooling, and multiple trunk paths. Not only do we have multiple trunks to each switch, we actually have a crossover between each of the controllers to different switches. So if we were to lose an entire switch, we would still have an alternate path uh, to our data. Our storage, dual active active redundant iSCSI controllers, dual array controllers, and RAID 6. Uh, there is nothing in this sequence that you can't lose multiples of at, and at a times level across this infrastructure and you won't keep running, period. Um, I'm gonna, yes, I'm sorry. Is there any way that this particular setup down. Yes, there is. It's called a plane running into it, a bomb, a fire, and that kind of leads to the next thing. This this might not, within this picture, 
it's the perfect no single point of failure surveillance solution. It doesn't factor in uh, major catastrophe. However, we do have a provision for that. Excuse me. Um, this is never remembered. What happens if the central site goes down? All right. We had wonderful surveillance systems in both of the Twin Towers, and all of the data was held within the Twin Towers. Even the emergency center for the city of New York was housed within the towers. Um, but there, there are just major catastrophes. There's fires. Uh, there's there's kooks. I, we have all kinds of things that are happening. Uh, so if you lose your central site, you're down. And not only that, you might have lost the video that would show the cause of the problem. So whenever you get into these situations, you're an end user planner or you're a reseller, please, you spent all of this money uh, to create a no single point of failure environment create an external site, a disaster recovery site. It does not have to be a fully operational site. We realize that uh, you know, rerouting cameras and multiples of servers and everything else to a remote site isn't always practical. Uh, however, for not a lot of money, you can take your storage uh, without any external software, no host base, no extra servers. Uh, the Seahawk SX has the capability to asynchronously replicate uh, across a wide area network uh, to a, a single controller or another Voyager, if you wish, uh, all of the video that comes into it. So if you did lose your central site, two things can happen. One, you can uh, view the video uh, to see what happened or caused it or add uh, more information to what happened at the site. Uh, and two, you can use that data to restore back uh, all of your parameters, your uh, OS information, as well as all of your video. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it is something to work or to, to bring to mind. We had a large site uh, that myself and another salesperson were working on, and we covered everything in the world except for the building collapsing. And uh, they did go back and respec it, and they did make a provision for a data disaster recovery vehicle, you know, 100 miles down the road. That, come on, I've got a problem here. Okay, I guess it brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, are there any questions, anything that seemed odd? Uh, you know, keep in mind uh, that this is uh, is an ideal situation. You don't always have the luxury of secondary this or that, but at a minimum, always put in redundant spec in redundant this or redundant power supply. Take an extra NIC port. Take extra switch ports. All of the different small areas that you can uh, to increase availability, and uh, don't sacrifice. Uh, you know, at a storage or server level, and then there is that no single point of failure requirement. As of right now, I don't have any questions queued up, folks. If you have any questions, please feel free to send them through right now. We'll get those answered for you. Oh, looks like there's one coming through standby for just a sec. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, that's it. All right, and again, uh, as you're signing out, please do the survey. We would really appreciate it, and thank you for attending.